freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode number 258 of Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearms.com, your nationwide hometown gun shop. I am one of your hosts, Cheryl Todd. And I'm the other guy, Dan Todd. Our theme today is Heels to Holster, and our guest is Shirley Waltrell. Shirley is an NRA certified instructor, empowerment motivational speaker, and author of Heels to Holsters. This book is a memoir of how she discovered the warrior inside that she survived an abusive relationship and thrived in the aftermath. She serves as the secretary on the board of Women's Outdoor Media Association, the WOMA, which focuses on increasing media attention for women in the fields of shooting, hunting, fishing, and archery. And she is also the DC Project Florida State Director. Welcome to the show, Miss Shirley. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl and Danny, for having me on. I appreciate being here. And I can't wait to talk to you about all this fun stuff that I'm doing. Absolutely. And so um, let's just dive right in to this book. Tell us about this, Heels to Holster. Heels to Holster, actually, I just did a launch on it in June, the end of June. I'm self-published on Amazon, and I did hold the bestseller title for a while. Well, congratulations. That's huge. Thank you. I never thought that was coming. Of course, I never thought I'd be writing a book either. Uh, the book itself is tells about an abusive relationship I was in and how I survived it. And then the second part tells how I found, um, I call the warrior in myself, how I found that warrior so I could take my life back. Because mm-hmm. after that trauma, I was a different person. I wasn't, mm-hmm. I wasn't uh, the person that I was before. I was more introverted and no self-esteem, questioned a lot. I had a lot of fears, a lot of fears. Absolutely. And uh, so the first part of the story, like I said, I take the reader through the whole event, what happens, and um, and I never thought, never thought in my life that I'd be in a relationship with someone that would want to actually do me harm. Hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm from, a, I'm a farm girl, I'm a farm girl from the good old north, north, from Pennsylvania. You know, I never hurt anybody. I was always kind to people, and I never ever expected someone to want to harm me. And I. Th- I think uh, what I found out as I've taken this path that there's a lot of women that are, are faced with that same situation, mm-hmm. domestic violence, physical violence of some kind with an uh, intimate partner. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's shocking to me, the numbers too. How did you break free from that, Shirley? For me, it was a, I should see, I was in a, I had a great mm-hmm. career. You know, my life was going great, had a career, I thought everything was perfect, was in this relationship with someone that was listening to me, was attentive, and to valued my opinion. Well, that kind of stopped at a certain point, and in, in the book I describe it, I'm not sure which came first, the chicken or the egg. I'm not sure if I started to see the red flags and, and kind of tried to pull away, or if he started changing, become more possessive. Mm. And um, it, it, it took a lot, of, a lot of strength for me to stand up to the fear that I was facing and to walk away. Uh, there, there was like the turning point, the turning point for the whole relationship was uh, on a Saturday. Uh, I got a phone call and we were starting to break things off a little bit. He got a little more possessive. He was showing up places unexpected. He was following me because otherwise he wouldn't know where I was. Mm -hmm. Um, He had access to my apartment 
even though I changed the keys. Mm. He had access to my phone bill, even though that's supposed to be private. He had mm. access to things that I didn't know how he got a hold of it. And this one Saturday, I got a phone call. Um, he was taking care of one of my cats. And, you know, you get that gut feeling inside that you shouldn't do something. Well, I had that. But yet the back of my head is going, oh, you know, he's not going to hurt you. You're crazy. Why are you feeling that way? So I went over to his house because this, this cat that I had had heart problems and it was sick. And he said, oh, it won't take its medicine. So I went over there and I'm standing outside the door in the little screened in area. And he's talking to me about, you know, making it sound like I have to come in. And, and there was a, a part of me that did not want to step over that threshold. And I just stood there and I, I, I fought with myself and I finally gave in. I thought, well, you know, I, I, I love animals. And once again, how could anybody want to hurt me? Yeah. I mean, so I stepped over that threshold and, and as I walked down the hall, I could feel something was different, but I didn't know what. Mm. And then all of a sudden, as soon as the front door closed, and then I could see this used to be a house that the windows were, the shades were all open. It was kind of welcoming and all the shades were closed and the garage door ended up being closed as I walked down the hall. And, and that's when I just kind of, I knew I'd made a mistake. And from then, a whole lot of stuff started to happen. Um, basically, it was held against my will for a number of hours. Mm. And um, Terrifying. It, it was, <laughs> there was a point in this whole thing when it was that fight or flight, you know. Mm -hmm. There was a point where I said, you know, I'm not going down fighting. And, and there's a lot of other people that got wrapped up in, in the whole event. Uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time explaining everything, but the point is that I got pushed to the limit where it was going to be his life or mine. Mm -hmm. And and things didn't happen the way I thought. I had no knowledge of guns. You know, I might have shot 10 rounds because my ex-husband bought me a, a gun, a 22, And I had no knowledge of guns. And one was brought out and I had to determine what I was going to do. You know, do I go for it? What? Mm. And um, which to my surprise, the gun didn't do what I wanted it to. Um, my goal was just to get the gun to, to fire so that the neighbors could hear it, so they could call the police, and nothing happened. Wow. So, yeah, and then, then things went on a different curve after that. And uh, so, yeah, it, it was a, a situation that I wouldn't want anyone to go through, but by the grace of God, I'm here today. And mm -hmm. I always say there's two things that saved my life. That's law enforcement and taking my first pistol class. Wow. And awesome. yeah. And it, it aggravates me that they're trying to take both of those away. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah. It's, it's for your own life. good, though. It's for your own good, they yeah, think. Yeah, sure it is. They have mm -hmm. no idea. Mm -hmm. I mean. So what was the catalyst then that inspired you to sit down and put pen to paper and, and tell this story? That is, that, that is a, such a hard thing to, you know, expose. Uh, your <clears throat> your I started doing things and fears. Like women's paper. gun uh, seminars, uh, introduction to, to firearms. I, I got into the firearm industry. I was in IT. I was, worked for the, in an office for 33 years. I was an IT director. And then I got into firearms training and after I retired from there and I started speaking to women about firearms, you know, safety rules, how to, you know, what you need to do to select a firearm. And then in the middle of that, those seminars, I would hand out pieces of paper and pencil and say, um, I'm going to do a poll. Have you ever been physically abused in your life? And I said, right, yes or no. And out of those seminars, probably about 70 women total, I think there was, 63% said yes. Oh, gosh. And, and every time I read those numbers, it would just, tears would just well up in my eyes. I'm like, what's going on? And... And when they heard me share part of my story that I'm a survivor of physical violence, abusive relationship, it's like a secret society. They afterwards come talk to me. Yeah, so was I, you know, there was some, there's, for me, there was a form of embarrassment about the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Like I was responsible for it, mm -hmm. which today I definitely am not responsible for it. And, and to put it out in paper like this, 
was scary. I got to tell you, um, people were going to know stuff about me and I'm a very personal person and they were going to know things and we know what happened. And, and there's a possibility they judge me. So the fact that there were so many women coming to me that they had lived this, I just thought, well, maybe if I tell my story and how I turned my life around and I found that inner warrior that let me be the person I always wanted to be, a different person, a more outgoing person. Uh, not that I don't, I'm not flooded with fears at times, but I've got the uh, self-esteem now and the confidence and I know the word empowerment gets overused sometimes, but that's no other way to explain how I felt after that first pistol class I took. And that was my catalyst to changing my life and then talking to these women. That's what got me to start putting my story on paper. Well, it's very brave. And I so appreciate that, that you would put yourself out there in that way because I, I can't help but believe that there are going to be women who are so many women that are positively impacted to say to, to recognize things maybe about their current situation that they they want to you know ignore the voice right that internal voice maybe they'll they'll listen to that more maybe they're, they're already in a, a really volatile situation and they'll take the steps to to uh, become more safe and more proactive and so I appreciate that you know, I had a sister that was uh, uh, abused so bad that she ended up in the hospital. And she had always, at the time, thought that it was her fault. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot to get her out of that relationship. Even after, after the hospital visit, you know, after the hospital, it took the family and, and supporting her mm -hmm. a lot to get her out of that situation. But they do feel that they're to blame. But, you know, as far as responsibility, it's their responsibility to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes they need family members to help with that. I'm so glad you were able to get out of your situation. Yeah, and, and the thing is also, I got to admit, I was one of those people that would say, well, why, why don't these women just leave these mm. violent relationships? Mm. Mm. Like I it's totally just so easy. get it now. <laughs> I mean, I totally get it. It's that you have to overcome such fear your life and if you have kids their lives are in danger mm -hmm. i mean fear fear is a very powerful emotion and it drove me for a while oh, and yeah. it either drives you in what, the direction to get away from it or just stay where you are trying to survive well and many abusers are are narcissists and narcissists are brilliant at twisting the mind of their victim so that their victim is so confused and so frozen and feels like, oh, it must be me. I'm, I'm seeing things wrong or, you know, so there is a lot more going on there than if you're just totally clear of mind and, and clear of, of emotion and, and investment and history with a person and just say, well, why don't you just leave? It's just so simple. <laughs> it sounds simple, doesn't it? But yeah. also, the thing I, I, I share about is the the wounds, the battle wounds that you get. Mm. A lot of them, I mean, I remember the bruises and the bite marks and the, the feeling of whiplash. And, and I remember all those. Well, days and weeks healed all that. But the the other wounds that are so deep emotionally, those are the ones that nobody sees. And basically... I'm speaking for myself, I had to deal with them myself. I mean, nobody could help me deal with what I was feeling and, and the, those wounds that I had to somehow heal. And for me, the thing that did it was, was like I said, that, that first firearms class seven years ago. I never mm. touched a gun before that. Mm. So it took me you, out of my comfort zone. Yeah, how do, you, how do you go back to trusting somebody again? You know, that's the hard part that I, I think is, because when you first met the gentleman that you had, We'll call him a gentleman. He's not, but uh, he he didn't start out abusive. So, mm -hmm. how do you when you start another relationship? How do you get that trust back? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of it has to do with getting your confidence back that you are in control, and that no one's going to take that control away from you. I guess I don't know. What do you do? You you said it just exactly. It's it's about me. I I now am in control. I'm not as. Uh, my self-esteem and everything is so much more. And, and just like being my own first responder, 
if someone were to attack me, whether I know them or not, my emotional first responder is there to take care of myself first. I am to the point where I can put myself first before that never used to be the case. I put other people before me, but now um, the fact that I draw from myself, mm. I, don't, I don't look to, I, I, law enforcement is very important, but I, I believe it's important for me to be my own first responder because just like they say, I've got plenty of law enforcement friends that say, when seconds count, we are minutes away. Yeah. And, and because I'm going to be my first responder physically, I have to do it emotionally too. And I think that's a mindset that was gradual and in the things that I've been doing, constantly stepping out of my comfort zone, which is scary. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So what would be for you like the thing that you would hope to accomplish by putting so much of yourself out there in the written word? Uh, my goal is just to in inspire women that are survivors, whether they're in that situation now or they're out of it, to to step out of their comfort zone. I don't. Uh, it doesn't have to be firearms. It could be anything, and then find a way to to feel empowered by that. I mean, I when like I said, when I took my first pistol course, it was an eight-hour course, and I drove home that day. I was not the same, Shirley. I, I, I felt it. I felt more confident. I was empowered. I was like, oh, I don't know what this is, but it feels good. And it rolled into my personal life, rolled into my, my business life, the, the whole thing. And it took me a number of years to find that. I mean, and if I can help another woman to find it quicker, I wish I had found it quicker, but it, we get where we're supposed to be when we're supposed to be there. And and if I can help them, to inspire them, to let them know that they can take their life back. They don't have to let that event um, define them anymore. Yeah. Well, I sure. think you're telling people that also that the ones that have never had an experience like that, that you can prevent it from happening. Because, you know, firearms training classes aren't just about firearms. They're about mm -hmm. awareness about what's around you in the community. Uh, like when you go to your car, how you carry your groceries, how you look at other people around you, all these mm -hmm. things would give you the power. And if you have the power, maybe the situation would never happen, you know? So I, it's awesome. No, I'll expand on that and say that being your own first responder goes beyond simply owning a firearm, right? Mm -hmm. It and does. Since we are talking to the millions upon millions of brand new first time gun owners and the millions more who are still probably, you know, on that fence contemplating that, that making that move into being a firearms owner, what can you talk, tell us about taking on that part of the responsibility that the actual owning of the tool? Um, well, first as a firearms instructor, Lately, I have been busy, and it's I a good thing. Believe it, and that it's is a, good a good thing, thing. <laughs> <laughs> because they're not just buying firearms; they're just they're buying firearms, and they want to know how to safely handle them. Mm -hmm. uh, I get a lot of women that come to me; they want to learn how to handle a firearm, whether maybe because their husband has one. Uh, current affairs right now; they want to be able to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. So. It's important that, that they understand that. They understand that a firearm is a tool and they understand how to safely handle it. And I also touch base on situational awareness. And, and, and when you're walking down that sidewalk, be aware, look around, because there's, there's three things that, that criminals are looking for or someone, a victim that they're looking for. They're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. they, they want someone that, that's not gonna put up a struggle. It, it can be easily, uh, attacked or, or whatever, and they can get in and out real quick. They're not going to put up a fight. So when I teach firearms instructing, I also teach, be aware of your surroundings, you know, be aware of what's happening. Because if you can knock out any one, two or three of those things, you're less likely to be a victim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've seen that, you know, I've, I've been in shopping. I mean, I hate to say, I kind of admit this, but I've been in situations where, you know, I'm older and I, people would, start to approach me because I have my guard down. But as soon as they get close enough, my guard goes up and they turn around and walk away. Mm -hmm. And I, I've seen it happen. So I know that, hey, maybe I should have been a little more attentive earlier. 
when I walk out of the grocery store, even in the grocery store, they'll follow you out of the store. Mm -hmm. You need to know of your surroundings. You need to know what's going on, where your car parked, where your car keys are, what your kids are doing, all these things. And these are things that are taught by people like you. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and actually, in my book here, <laughs> the last chapter, I talk about scenarios. And, and I, because I, I've done scenario training at um, West Orlando Firearms Training called WAFT. And there's things you can do. Your, your voice, your voice is a form of self-defense. If you get loud, you get drawn attention and they're not going to want, they don't want people to look at you. They don't want, if they're going to attack you, they don't want people to be watching. So I teach them to use your voice, be aware of your surroundings. If you don't feel comfortable, don't listen to your gut. Don't, don't be like me and just barrel through because just because I think I've got to do this. Listen to your gut, go back to the grocery store, get an escort from the manager. There's so many things that we can do so we don't become victims. And that part is kind of easy if you're out in public, you know, be aware of where you're sitting in a restaurant and movies and everything. But for me, the hard part was once again, back to if you're knowing the person, you're in a relationship. Sometimes that gut feeling isn't, um, isn't as prevalent because yeah. your guard is down. Right. So yeah, there, there's kind of like two scenarios for me. You know, but sure. don't a you think of someone you don't know and someone you do know, but kind of sure. like, just like in a relationship, just the same as somebody is a stranger in a relationship that you have, if you have strength and you have power that you can suggest to your partner that, uh, you're not going to get away with that. You can do this. This is how far you can go. And after that point, you're not going to get away with it. I, I mean, I have that with Cheryl. I mean, it's not like we've ever had any physical thing but i know how far i can go with her okay and then <laughs> push those buttons so long yeah. right yeah. right and so if if you are the weak person weak not weak but not not showing signs of strength that you would hey like I'm gonna boundaries You're i'm talking gonna challenge about boundaries, boundaries strong boundaries i'm gonna i'm gonna put boundaries on that then maybe you could prevent that because hey a guy most people won't go where it's hard hmm. even even the, the, the people you meet on the street, they're not going to take a challenge. They're going to go for the weakest, right? That's what they're going to do. And I'm trying to figure out how to put this in words, but it's the same with the relationship. People, when they're angry with somebody, they look for their weakest, they look for a weak moment mm -hmm. and they know how far they can go with that. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if the person's strong, well, I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to go, go leave the house for a while or something. I don't know. I, I just think so you're that, asking the question. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like whether it's personal or it's a stranger. Yeah, you're exactly right. And, and that also brings up something else that, in my opinion, and something I'm, I'm starting to work on with my book, a percentage of all the proceeds are going to a nonprofit that helps survivors of domestic violence. Awesome. And one of my things is, is, okay, I know what how empowered I was with firearms training. And if we can take our young, young ladies, whether they be going off to college, because I think of it as one in six college students are in, in, in a dating scenario and they get attacked or they get raped. Mm -hmm. um, so if we can, just like you're saying, build them up, empower them so they know their boundaries so that the, the, the people they're going out with can feel the energy they're not going to take advantage of them. You're absolutely right. That that's how I feel, yeah. and I want to at some point um, find a way to educate young ladies, whether they're even elementary school sex trafficking. Mm. They're, they're taking kids, so mm. if these kids know how to put up, these ladies know how to put up. A, young ladies know how to put up a fight. They're less likely to be taken, right. and, and just kind of educate them so they feel like they can defend themselves. So they walk different and they talk different. And maybe take away the 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 avenue for for the for these people these men that want to be hostile to women. So if we take away their sort of like their their feeding ground, yeah, you know, maybe they'll change or go. Somewhere and I want to make sure it's it. clear: I'm not saying that women that are in domestic violence situations are weak. No, I'm not saying they're no, weak. no, no, no. But I, you know, it's not. It's but 
that the, a predator looks for predator looks the for, areas right. that they are going to have the areas of least resistance. Right. And I think that's what you're trying, trying to say. To say, by say. The, yes. the that's exactly leaf. right. And I had those areas of least resistance and now they're not right. there. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> but well, when, when, oh, go ahead. No, that's okay. Oh, you were saying about how do you trust again? Yeah. And I don't think I really answered that. That's a good question. It's very hard. It's very hard to do that. And I just, keep I just keep the faith um yeah. and I, I put myself first right yeah. and, and the thing is mm -hmm. you trust in your first you trust yourself mm -hmm. that has a lot to do with it too you you know if you get into a situation like that you can handle it so it's easier there too right it's got to be easier when you believe in yourself yeah you're less to become a victim well, right I think that's what you're talking about with teaching uh, children younger and younger, male and female, really, because in a relationship, like you said, that is a little bit different scenario, but in a public setting out and about in the world, you know, sometimes we're, we feel that, that internal feeling that maybe what we're about to do isn't safe for me or whatever. And we find ourselves, do I, do I do one thing that might embarrass me or do I do the other that could actually harm me unto death, right? Let's err on the side of embarrassment. You know, just like when you're leaving a grocery store and you feel funny and you, you feel like I should really just go back inside and ask for somebody to, you know, walk me out, ask the manager to walk me out or something. That could be really embarrassing. Be embarrassed and alive. Right. Exactly. Yep. I, I don't know if being embarrassed is the right word, because if you believe in yourself and you know that there's a situation out there you might not be able to handle, I go in there with full confidence saying, I need help. Mm -hmm. I need you to come out here and help me. That's not an embarrassment. That's saying, I want some help. Yeah, it's different. I like it. I like it. That's good. And people, we don't really teach our young people how to engage in any kind of a conflict well, you know. Um, and so if, if you do have to tell somebody no, or if you have to raise your voice and say, stop, right, that's conflict. And it's, it's hard for people to feel like it's okay. Like has somebody ever given them permission to do that? Do you discuss that sort of thing also in your book? Uh, yes. Yeah, Cause I talk about, you know, using your voice, speaking up, um, but right now, our young people, what are they doing? They're looking, they're looking at this little, this little thing right here half the time, right? They're not paying attention to their surroundings. Right. They don't know how to communicate. So when someone comes up and maybe startles them, what do they do? Um, so, yeah, th this thing right here, I, I, I preach a lot about this. Like, yeah. Put this down when you're walking to the parking lot and I'll look around. So, sure. so <clears throat> if I could say something. Okay, so if I... If I thought that I was somebody that was a person that would engage in domestic violence control, I, I would put myself in the shoes that I would find a woman that or needed... Or a man. I mean, well, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being me right now. Oh, because you're okay. a guy. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm a guy, and I'm looking for a woman that is weak, that doesn't show positive energy, somebody who always needs help, is a victim, and then... I know that I can control her, right? Mm -hmm. I can be yep. the, I can be the domestic violence guy, and not have to worry about her challenging me. And so I think that that's where when you, have the trust issue. When you first have a relationship with somebody, that if you go in there with you meet somebody and you go in there and say, hey, you know, ah, I'm charged up. I'm, I, I, you know, I can protect myself. All these other things, and not like a somebody who needs help that if a person is a domestic violence kind of person, he's going to say, no, she's not for me. Does that make sense? It, it does, because I describe it, in my book, I describe it as, at that point in my life, I was willing to accept breadcrumbs, you know, anything that fell from the table, you know, give me a little bit of attention, do right. anything that make me feel like, you know, if you think I'm special, then I'm special. Mm -hmm. And then how it turned around now, I know I, I, who I am, and, right. and if I know I'm special, and I'm going to, I demand someone to treat me like I'm special. So, so somebody you're, who wants, you're exactly right. Right. Somebody who wants power is going to stay away from you because they don't want the conflict. They right. don't. Whether it's yeah, domestic violence or a challenge in life, just whatever, 
they're if they if they want to be above you, I'm not saying it's right, but they want to be above. She's way above me. I mean, she keeps me on my toes. <laughs> He's afraid I'm going to paper cut I'm, him. I'm even serious. As we're I'm here. serious. <laughs> anyway, so, moving on to, uh, and I think also kind of tapping onto what we're saying that you as a survivor of domestic violence, what do you see that can be done to lower the number of domestic violence cases? And, and that's kind of what I was saying before, teaching our young children, our young girls, how to defend themselves, changing their mindset so they're more confident, more positive, because it's not just so much that I'd have to say, I, I, I'm in control, I can defend myself. It's a mindset. You carry, for me, I carry myself different. I carry myself different today and every time after I train, if I go for scenario training, on my way home, I'm a different person again. I'm a, I, I just change a little bit. I'm a more improved Shirley. Not that I've changed a whole person. I'm still Shirley, but I'm an improved version of Shirley. Um, but yeah, I think if we take away that food chain that, that they they thrive for, that weakness, that, you know, something's got to change. And that's, that's my hope. You know, that's, I've, I've been trying to study this and trying to figure it out because let's face it. The legal system can only do so much. And when you're talking about any type of domestic, domestic violence, it's a he said, she said, you know, it, it's hard to, to and, then, and then if they go back, if the woman goes back because she's afraid for her kid's life or her life, it looks bad again. So that's not always, the, I don't know that that's the way to resolve this or bring the numbers down. So I was trying to look at a different avenue and that's where I'm looking maybe. So if you think positive, if you are positive, you're going to have a better outlook with your partners. You're going to have a better outlook getting a job. Just overall, if you're positive and, hey, I can do that, right? Absolutely. Well, Miss Shirley, thank you so much for your book. And I love right here that it says a warrior is someone who faces life on life's terms. That is so awesome. And I so appreciate you uh, taking the time to not only put your thoughts down in this form that I know is going to impact millions. I'm, I'm just going to say millions of lives in a positive way. And for coming on and talking to us about it, uh, if folks want to follow you and they want to, um, you know, get a hold of a copy of this book, how do they do that? You can find my book on Amazon. Just look up Heels to Holster on Amazon. You can purchase it there. Uh, you can go to my website, ShirleyWattrell.com, or you can follow me on Facebook. I have a Shirley Wattrell Firearms Training, and I'm also on Instagram, Shirley Wattrell Firearms. Fantastic. So it, Fantastic. Yeah. Shirley, congratulations on the book. Thank you for being on the show today. It's awesome. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Holy cow. You getting nervous? I'm going to paper cut you. No, <laughs> I can handle it. I think you can. Um, that's such an important topic. You know, we don't have that fear and it, it's hard to get into that mindset, but then I, she brought up, you know, and it reminded me of what my sister had went through mm -hmm. and what the family went through on that. And it's just like, it opens the door and said, oh, you know, you don't even think about it. And then all of a sudden, I mean, it's, it's a big problem. It's, mm -hmm. it's everywhere. And uh, yeah. And again, narcissists, I mean, they will find a way, you know, to take somebody that's even a very, like I kept wanting to challenge you on the word weak because they'll find somebody that, that even is strong, but they'll find that, oh, right, that right. in road, it's just like, that yeah. one Place blind spot. Yeah, blind yeah. spots. And again. that happens walking out the grocery store. And I and I didn't really want to use the word weak, but I didn't know another word for it because mm. obviously that is a weak point. So it is weak. Yeah. There's some, and we all have weaknesses. We all have them somewhere in our body. And uh, a, a pro at wanting control can find those weaknesses, yeah. whether they're politicians or mm. they're your next I was door neighbor. When we were going to get to the you politicians. Know, so, yeah. Right. But it's yeah, true. they use fear and, and coercion and, you know, the right. promise of safety and all kinds of different things. And so the, the main reason that I wanted to, you know, just come back to that and say that even strong people have been, you know, victimized and, and um, abused is because if somebody's out there listening going, well, I'm a strong-minded person, I'm a go-getter, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you 
you can't become um, under the spell of somebody that is very, very adept at using um, manipulation and tools of that nature. But well, anyway, I, have to I think know, we beat that. No, so. anyway, to it, I have to say the strongest man in the universe had a weakness, and that was Superman and Kryptonite. And <laughs> so somebody found that Kryptonite was his weakness and used that against him Boom. many, 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 many times. But what was Batman's weakness? I don't remember what his weakness was. Um, I think he just went batty. That's I all. think you just brought this up because you want to brag about the fact that your cannons were in Batman versus Superman. Or is it Superman versus Superman? No, Batman? it's Batman versus Superman. They were that. in the movie. But I'm really serious. That, that So even the strongest person in the universe yes. has a weakness. Correct. So they'll find it. Yes. You have a weakness. You have a weakness. And I have a weakness uh, that I, I don't know. I, I don't want to discuss it on the air, but <laughs> I'm sure that I do. I haven't. 35 probably, years, I haven't uh, found it yet. It's it's probably carrot cake. She always seems to find a way to challenge I'm, me I'm whenever hungry, I think so I got her on something. Oh, no, you didn't. So right now, all I can think about is food. because Carrot cake. Mm. Yum. <laughs> Cracker Barrel. Hey, I support carrot cake from Cracker Barrel. If that they is, have it all over I the nation, it. I'm not yeah. sure. But that is the best carrot cake so in the good. world. I don't know how we got off on that. That will All make right. a skinny person fat. We got, <laughs> yeah, oh, tell me about it. Okay, we're going to wrap up. We are going to thank our amazing listeners. Thank you so much for taking these conversations into your spheres of influence, whether you are watching us on YouTube, GunStreamer, or on the Opsland smartphone app, or whether you're listening to us through our website, which is gunfreedomradio.com you click the on demand tab and you, you can binge can listen, listen to, to your heart's content. content to all of the episodes that we have there and when you want to learn more about our guests like our amazing Shirley Watrall who is on today you click the guest tab and you'll see photos and bios and links to uh, their books and other things other works that they've done um, through there. It's a really rich resource and we don't hate it when you spend time there. Uh, so thank you so much to Shirley for taking the time to come on today. And uh, until next time. Pray for your nation. Yes, absolutely. Pray for this nation. We pray are, for your leaders. All of them, Cheryl. All of them. All of them. Every single. Even everyone. the ones I don't like. Why don't we just move on? Okay. And Especially the ones. I don't like. No. Are there any that I don't like? Oh, come on. <laughs> come on. Do we, do we have other. enough time for that? Be good to each other. Have a great week. And God bless. God bless.